Good afternoon. I'm Greg Niemeyer, and I'm pleased to introduce Amy Owen from McAvoy Foundation for the Arts, who's going to talk to us today about our special co-production, where McAvoy Foundation for the Arts and UC Berkeley are uh, jointly hosting Leila Weefer in conversation with Isaac Julian to discuss Lessons of the Hour, a show that opened just yesterday, and it is truly a phenomenal experience to be there. I was able to join, and uh, I'm passing the word to Amy. Please introduce us to your show. Thanks so much, Greg, and thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. I just want to take a quick moment on behalf of the McAvoy Arts team to thank our artists, Isaac and Layla, for sharing their incredible work with us, and to our partners at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive and UC Berkeley Arts and Design for making this program possible. We're supposed to be launching the first program in our In Conversation series uh, with you all today. An exciting lineup of online events are also planned through the end of the year, featuring the likes of Be Who Be Rich, Angela Davis, and Sarah Lewis, among many others. So we hope you can join us uh, for those as well. Lessons of the Hour, as Greg mentioned, um, just opened at McAvoy Arts yesterday and is foregrounded by the West Coast debut of Isaac's 10 screen film installation with related photography and selections from the McAvoy Family Collection, curated by Mark Nash as well as Layla's incredible screening room program, New Labor Movements. And while today's discussion will feature images and clips from the work, the exhibition was really designed as an immersive physical experience. So we truly hope you can see the show in person. McAvoy Arts is a fantastically intimate and safe place to bring live art back into your daily routine. So we hope you'll head over to mcavoyarts.org to plan your visit. It's free and we really hope to see you soon. Um, thanks so much again, and back over to you, Greg, for uh, formal introductions to the artists. Okay, thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. So we're very honored to be in the presence of two exacting and generous filmmakers who address issues of race and gender so profoundly, Isaac Julian and Leila Weefer. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, man, yesterday I was able to visit the exhibit that uh, Isaac uh, and uh, Leila put together. Uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac making the main piece, The Lessons of the Hour, and uh, Leila uh, curating the uh, video series that goes with it. And it is truly an immersive experience. And I just want to share this picture to um, illustrate what immersion means. It means that you sit there for maybe half an hour completely immersed in the constellation of videos that and sounds and images and experiences and deep feelings that uh, the work evokes. And uh, this uh, two people seated there really uh, are profoundly immersed and that's exactly how I felt. So next slide, please. To be more specific, Isaac Julian is an artist and filmmaker. Uh, artistic practice incorporates the moving image, photography and installation, as we saw, to create open-ended narratives that invite spectators to interpret the work through the act of physical and sensorial immersion. Lessons of the Hour, Frederick Douglass, 2019, presents an urgent and immersive 10 screen film installation and photography exhibit that explores the life of Fred Frederick Douglass, the visionary African-American writer, abolitionist, statesman, statesman and freed slave. Uh, Frederick Douglass also uh, speaks extensively about photography and the use of his image and how the image conveys his interior state. Uh, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man of the tw 19th century, and uh, um, so he saw photography as a real tool for change. Uh, Leila Weefer is an artist, curator, lecturer at the Art Department of Art Practice here in UC Berkeley, and teaches a wonderful courses, uh, even though uh, teaching online video is not easy. I, I particularly noticed that um, Leila inspired her students to build makeshift tripods in one class, and that was really uh, uh, exciting and touching way of uh, acknowledging the present moment. Leila Weefer, uh, practice in video installation, writing, and curation, examines the performativity intrinsic to systems of belonging present in our lived experiences, and we'll see a clip of her work um, shortly. Their resonant video program, The New Labor Movement, Movements creates an intertextual dialogue between emerging and established filmmakers whose work function as thoughtful responses to intergenerational conceptions of American and transnational blackness. With that, I would like to um, switch the screen back to video so we can uh, introduce our speakers. So, 
we can stop the slides and there we go. So Isaac, Leila, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, we're gonna give the floor to you to uh, enter into your conversation about uh, video and race and gender and cinema and time and all these wonderful subjects. As an opening question, I wanted to see um, if I could ask you how you got passionate about filmmaking in the very first instance, because I think you both have really compelling stories. And um, I think many of us who are just starting out as artists might be inspired by that. I suck, I understand your, your filmmaking uh, began with the riot. Is that true? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I would say that I was very um, inspired um, and in a way lucky as a young um, teenager to come across um, some artisanal filmmakers who live just across the street from where I lived. And in a way, the rest is history, that basically they um, were working as um, independent filmmakers and photographers and I was very curious and they introduced me to photography at quite an early age, um, around 15. So I was actually making photographs around that age. And also I had gone onto a film set um, when I was also a teenager. And so in a way I got this sort of introduction into um, making film, which really was quite unusual, I think, for somebody like myself. but. Um, yes, I would say that in a way, um, the motor driving relationship to my practice began, um, I would say, in a more substantial sense, um, after graduating from St. Martin's School of Art in the early 80s, um, when I came about into um, meeting um, a young group of other um, graduates and formed ourselves into, into the Sankofa Film Video Collective. And that was actually very instrumental in terms of making work and in the very early 80s um, as probably most people know in Britain there were a number of riots which took place in um, mainland Britain um, which were due to um, police violence and basically this um, created a kind of cultural revolution in terms of um, institutional responses and there were too many voices excluded from the main bastions of um, both um, sort of film production and various sort of institutions. And we came about and were funded by Channel 4 Television and in a way began our kind of program of works as um, a collective then. And so, um, yes, I would say that it's very much connected to what had happened um, with riots on the streets of Britain that really crystallized the possibility to um, make works, early works. Thank you, crystallized the need for new voices to be brought into the center as well. Thank you for laying that out. Leila, would I give the word to you? Um, I, I maybe I don't envy the fact that it started in riot, but that's quite a poetic way to start your filmmaking practice. Um, mine started pretty early on as well. Uh, my father handed me a camera when I was, you know, a child, and since then I, I have been creating videos. I mean, in high school, um, I tried to fashion myself after my mother's sort of political just energy because she was a Black Panther. So I did a lot of um, PSAs as a teenager and, and, and music videos. And then I decided that um, I wanted to forefront writing in my practice. And it's interesting because poetry is really what led me into filmmaking, poetry and music really. And I, I studied writing and journalism at Howard before deciding that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And then I went to LA and decided that I wanted to try a hand at working in, you know, traditional Hollywood, which didn't necessarily work out um, because I was looking for something much more experimental and uh, a different way of telling stories that weren't as linear. And that was in the early 2000s. So I went to Mills College and that's really when I, in, in my grad program, discovered that I could 
do and do, be a filmmaker in a way that incorporates writing and, and spatial and architectural considerations. Thank you. And yeah. I know you have prepared some thoughts and uh, conversation. Uh, so I'm just going to play the videos as you request them and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I would actually like to open up Isaac with a single channel clip of lessons. Uh, that would be wonderful, yes. I mean, of course, it's not the same as seeing the 10 screen, but I think it works very well, um, you know, in, you know, our Zoom genre presentations. Absolutely. Okay, so here we go. You should see that now. And uh, three, two, one, rolling. Good day, everybody. You know, I take it as a compliment to my enslaved race that while summoning men here from the high seats of learning, philosophy, and statesmanship, you have also summoned one from the slave plantation. On this, the committee of management have in one act labeled their course both philanthropic and cosmopolitan. De Guerre by that simple and all abounding sunlight has converted a planet into a picture gallery. The gerotypes, ambrotypes, photographs, and electrotypes. And good and bad now adorn or disfigure all our dwellings. There seems to have been a pause in the video. We can go from there. <laughs> Perhaps we can just we can just use that snippet as an introduction. I mean, uh, that was that was a very rich snippet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's enough to lead us into the to the conversation. I really like to start with talking about movement with you um, because that is where we have a lot of overlap conceptually, both in lessons of the hour and new labor movements. Um, and new labor movements was really shaped by the notion of movement as this conceptually fluid system that was meant to reference movement and multiplicity, which is something that you know the two of us have discussed at large in the in the last couple of weeks. And it, it's even situated in some of um, Frederick Douglass's speech that we heard here. Movement is located within that philosophical and psychological and emotional landscape, as well as what is really dear to me, the cinematic and more corporeal and temporal and political re relationships that we have to movement. Um, and the program was really, of course, inspired by the life of Frederick Douglass and Isaac's depiction of that history uh, which is a history that situates the lives of slave descendants and basically all of us, those of us existing in the, the indirect effects and what I'd like to call the residue of slavery and movement and movements of many kinds from many perspectives. And each of the movements really are meant to reflect the stages of what I'm naming new labor, which isn't trying to be definitive in any way, but more of an ever evolving a dialogue and sensorial map of the transnational Black experience. Um, and I, I wish that we could have watched the rest of the quote, uh, uh, the film, because in that piece of the, the, the excerpt, Douglas does quote that he learned that the point from which a thing is viewed is of some importance. And it's really important to name that because these movements have been modeled in the spirit of that principle. Um, and to name the movements, it's assembly, uh, resistance and selfhood, freedom and liberation, and creation and emergence. And I consider movement as this really essential cinematic material across all of my practices, curatorial art uh, and writing, which are inherently linked. Uh, and these impressions of movement are synthesized in, in Isaac's film um, and my own visual practice in the film program. So 
Isaac, I open, I wanna open the conversation around transnational blackness uh, as one of the many considerations of movement here. And I'm curious, what are the other cinematic political manifestations located within the lessons uh, and the way you told Frederick Douglass's story? Well, yes, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that's very exacting about our moment that we are currently inhabiting is, in a sense, the kind of new generational response to, um, indeed, um, the works of Frederick Douglass and how those are conjoined um, by one generation of scholarship around Frederick Douglass, which I am indebted to. You know, I'm indebted to Henry Louis Gates and to Celeste Barnier um, and... I feel there's a way in which, in fact, you know, working quite closely with their texts and with um, Celeste Barnier as a sort of scholar of Douglas, I was able to map this question of Douglas, um, who, of course, was a great American orator, um, you know, had been um, incredibly um, pertinent in terms of his um, autobiography as a slave, which had, was incredibly successful, in fact, so successful that probably not everybody knows, but he actually had to escape America and live um, in the United Kingdom, um, where he resided mainly in Scotland um, for um, almost 21 months, almost two years, which was really quite a difficult time for him as a fugitive slave. And um, it was in this time, I think, you know, the, the question of Douglas, you know, not only being one of the preeminent, most important 19th century um, African American um, orators and politicians, um, but in a sense, this question of a transnational blackness became really paramount. It became really paramount in um, the whole work that he was doing as an abolitionist um, in relationship to questions around slavery and in relation to questions around abolitionism, that he saw himself as a leader and he led amazingly and um, in a very eloquent manner. And I think there's a way in which, um, for me, Douglas, um, in a way, for me, the making of this work, Lessons of the Hour, um, which was a commission actually, um, by the Memorial Art Gallery um, at the museum, which is part of the University of Rochester, um, where I was invited um, by John Hanhart and Jonathan Binstock to um, commission to make this work, which is quite unusual. And going to Douglas's grave in Rochester and really kind of being involved in this incredible journey. I mean, I just found so many things out myself. And I think. Um, his time in Scotland and his relationship to England um, was so paramount in terms of the ways in which he would, in a way, be able to campaign for the cause, um, for the cause of freedom and equality. And he, I mean, it was such, it was, it's just been so moving to be involved in this work and to be able to sort of then think about the question of movement um, in relationship to one's own practice and how in my work I've been able to, in a gallery context, work with the presentational mode of multiple screen works. And I guess someone could say, well, you know, why have a multiple screen work when you can just show a single screen work? We just shared a single screen work just um, here recently. And I think there's something that's very unique about the ways in which questions um, of um, sort of multi multiple temporality, but also the unique way that, um, if you like, the development of moving images, um, which in a sense we're all involved in, you know, we're all involved in looking at many boxes, we're here on Zoom, we could be on Facebook, we could be on Instagram, we're dealing with different screens all the time, we're interpolated by different screens, and this invariably seeps into an artist's practice. And so you don't only have that question of movement, which we're all participating in every day in our different screens, but also in relationship, if we think back historically of Douglas, there's a movement that he made across the Atlantic and in a way in his sort of quest for sort of language, um, 
the relationship to time, the fact that he was able to be really someone that was in command um, of um, the written word and his oratory was such that it captured and catapulted this cause. Um, and I wanted to capture that. So in the 10 screen presentation, it's really to do with the different nuances, the layers of time, and if you like, the poetics of attention that I want to bring the audience. The fact that he was so multi-layered and in a way very sophisticated, um, there's a way in which one's able to, I hope, um, also give a nod to the fact that Douglas was also really interested in art. Um, he wrote about photography, he was an avid art collector. If you go to his house today in Washington and see the hill, there is all the evidence there for show. He had an incredible collection. And his interest then, I would say, um, in the arts for me, um, as in a way signified in the presentation because the work in a way emulates this 19th century salon hanging system, um, you could say. Um, you know, when you had the salon, people, you know, had paintings and they, in a way, stacked them up on top of one another in a constellation. And we have this sort of constellation in this sort of modern version, you could say, um, in the presentation of the work. Um, and then hopefully what begins to happen is you have these associative aspects in different temporal times. Um, and I think that accumulates in the very end, not that I want to give everything away <laughs> for those who um, will come to McAvoy to see, um, I think, um, this beautiful presentation um, that they've done of the work. But, you know, you get to, again, see what does Douglas signify for today, you know? And so in the juxtaposition of the different screens, we have images which are quite contemporary images, which connect to his, if you like, 19th century mission and quest into the 21st century, um, where we have him give his speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, just opposed with um, the Freddie Gray riots in Baltimore in 2015, you know, city, which of course, uh, Douglas um, knew well, um, and those are counterposed with the question of movement um, and where we are now, you know. So I really, um, I was very struck, um, Leila, by your magnificent um, programme that you've made in relationship to the questions of movements um, and this incredible moment that we are in at this particular moment in terms of Black Lives Matter as a movement, um, which is incredibly pertinent, I think, um, now. And you have a you have a favorite film from the program, right? <laughs> I absolutely do. I am so like I have to say, you know, this program is so amazing. But Lonnie Holly, um, I snuck off the slave ship is an absolutely incredible work. And um, I have to say that this work for me, um, I snuck off the slave ship made in 2019, is such an amazing, I would say, um, like call and response in relationship to Lessons of the Hour, because um, I have to say, and maybe this might be a little bit controversial, but um, there's a film which we've all seen, um, which I'm an incredible fan of, um, by Arthur Jaffa, Love is the Message. And the subtitle and the message is death. And it's an amazing, amazing work. And you received the golden line for it, um, rightly so, in Venice. But I think one of the things that I felt when I saw Lonnie's work was mm -hmm. that I felt that there was a sort of correspondence to something which had this kind of redemptive um, aspect to it. Um, what I want to call a form of reparational aesthetics, 
you know, which is, you know, when the artist takes on this question of this current moment that one's in, but results, results to much more kind of poetic quests in relationship to creating not only this idea of hope, but this sort of long journey in, um, and maybe it's because that Noni is a musician, you know, and the way that sound and music is evoked in this work, which is just so moving and so fantastic. I just thought, oh, wow, this is a work, I think, which has this sort of long view in it. And I was also very moved by all the performative strategies, the use of the sculptural elements, um, in a way, senior figures, older African Americans participating in modern forms of performance, this, the, the lighting, the, the singing. I mean, it's just an incredible, incredible work. And, you know, um, you yeah, know, of course, all of those films really operate in the, in the, in, within complexity and, and nuance, right? Uh, and I snuck off the slave ship for those of you who haven't seen the program yet is, is a part of the second movement, Resistance and Selfhood. Uh, and Isaac and I have had long conversations about that film because it is really rich and complex. And it, I believe that it shows uh, the multiplicity of self uh, in a very inter interdisciplinary process. Um, in it, you'll see like bent metal and stone carvings. And I think all of those things are evidence that we and our ancestors are sort of revealed in simultaneity and multiplicity in the same ways that Isaac's Lessons of the Hour is revealed to us across 10 channels while we're living in this moment in time in that, that the film is depicting uh, through, through Douglas's story, we are seeing simultaneity. We are able to shift our gaze from one screen to the next and see this sort of circularity of time unfolding. Um, and, and I snuck off the slave ship similarly shows us that resistance can be soft and can come in the form of creative resistance. And, and resistance is also evidenced here in, in friction. Um, I think there's a scene where he's trying to free himself of chains and carving stone and bending, bending metal objects into faces. And I think there's something really special about the ma manipulation of material to bring change and to make a story visible in that way um, and make a dormant and ornament out of struggle. And similarly to lessons, there, there's this firework moment, fireworks moment that happens. Uh, as in, I snuck off the slave oh, ship. And it's like, you know, it's not setting fires, but fireworks and it's not burning down, but celebrating in the explosive nature of change and destroying and destruction. Um, and there's even a line in that, in the, in I snuck off the slave ship that references the contemporary slave ship, which, you know, I think in, in some way we're all, we all have a contemporary slave ship that we may be able to name, but he has a line that says museums are being built all over the world to house information. And I snuck off the slave ship just to sneak on another. Um, and that sort of self-awareness is really spoke to me. Um, and I'm only saying this because you told me to, Isaac. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad there, there's a line, there's a line. Um, oh, so that line uh, is really, really near and dear to me because my family is Liberian and uh, are, are part of the crew tribe, which was infamously known among slave traders and colonialists to be very resistant to capture and enslavement, which is not something, I mean, it's something to be very proud of. Um, but if, if and when the crew was captured in the 1700s, they would sneak off of the slave ship. They would, or kill themselves because they would do that rather than become property. Um, and then they also began to steer some of the slave ships. Uh, so there, there's a, a nugget, it's that nugget of history that draws me to the complexity of that narrative and to the, to the complexity of uh, Douglas's transnational, um, you know, politics and the, the ways that he, he thinks about language and, and his oratory practice. 
And I think if we think even about the speech, you know, what does the 4th of July, what to the slave is the 4th of July? I mean, it's a very radical proposition. And, um, and I think it's one where, you know, we have him questioning, you know, in a sense, the kind of core identity um, of nationalism um, in terms of its um, American version, um, which of course he's questioning. And I think there's a way in which um, through this sort of, if you like, um, you know, philosophical slave um, discourse that Douglas um, developed incredibly well, we get to have, you know, an insight into um, this space, you know, which, you know, also was a very demanding place for, for Douglas to occupy because as we know, you know, he did suffer from depression, you know, I mean, he did um, have, you know, great trouble as someone who had been traumatized by this experience as a child. And um, I think this weighed on him quite heavily, especially when, um, you know, he was um, in, in Scotland. But I think again, you know, yes, it's this, this you know, th this work, um, you know, um, by Lonnie, I Snuck Off the Slave Ship is incredible because the way it evokes this kind of poetic register and gives back a sort of reply, you know, um, you know, in relationship to this, if you like, deathly um, scenario um, that, you know, um, you know, um, obviously Douglas inhabited and it, of course of which he contested um, you know so is it simply love is a message and the, and the message is death you know I mean I think that's one part of it but I think there's another aspect you know which we glimpse at you know which is the question of resistance you know and it's this resistance which I was very core to attention in Douglas's work um, which I wanted to um, if you like embroil into the form of making the work um, and thus you know it's presented um, if you like in this scenographic flow of images in this sort of concave design and you could say you know that music was something which doctors turned to in his time of depression and um, in this work it's if you like a mirroring of the kind of musical notation into a visual notation of the screens and how the images work in correlation to one another, um, how the screens are edited, that you begin to have this sort of shared affinity. And if you're spectating, you can in co coalesce into different ways of looking and also in the sonic sense that it can encapsulate the audience and bring them into another space of meditation and reflection um, into the kind of subjectivity. Because I think the key question is, is that how can we, in a sense, um, also interpolate and give agency to the ways in which um, we want people to think both about history, um, but in a way history as something which belongs um, to us in a much more organic and fruitorial manner, you know, that actually, you know, the way that history um, has been um, constructed means that we are, if you like, barred, you know, from the ways in which we could truly reflect and meditate on culture. And so, I, you know, so for me, I mean, it was a revelation that Douglas indeed also had written about photography, you know, that he read about photography 75 years before Benjamin read about photography, you know, um, that we don't have, if you like, you know, the art history of photographers like J.P. Bohr, um, James Priestley Bohr, who was an amazing um, photographer who had his salons um, around America, who also struggled, um, but, um, you know, in a sense, how the fact that Douglas was the most photographed man of the 19th century, you know, and, you know, why should that be like an anomaly or something that should be a surprise, you know, 
why is that not common knowledge? So I think there's a way in which, you know, even if we think about, you know, relationship to sort of art history or relationship just to thinking about the kind of presence, the fact that, you know, he too was interested in art, uh, you know, that he um, collected it. Um, if you go to see the hill today, you'll see, you can see the evidence of it, um, that art had a role to play in trying to, if you like, um, what I want to say, be involved in a sort of aesthetics of reparation that was not just about naming a moment, you know, um, in its kind of nihilism, you know, that, you know, because of course we inhabit such a nihilistic moment, you know, um, it's the kind of looking through that um, as a form of response for um, a form of reparation that could serve um, and sustain aesthetically a being, you know, and so I think there are all these things which I felt very compelled to in the piece to explore and to make that be something which could be incredibly unique. Yeah, and and even in that, he was speaking of his interest in art and um, the multiple ways in which those interests manifested. I think literature is sort of at the heart of it, right? He was really interested in poetry and language uh, and something that the series, both the series and your film reveal is the, are the many ways in which the body creates movement and in, in sensorial experiences uh, yeah. and, how, and how historically speaking, Black folks generate and accelerate movement through sound and auditory experience um, as innovators in music, uh, employing the body as a percussive instrument, uh, and even understanding the power and resonance of the Black voice as an instrument for change in, spirit, in spiritual and political practices, really. Um, and it really shows how speech and song are vehicles in translating that transnational Blackness. Uh, through Douglas's words. And I, you know, being the orator that he was, he really understood that. Um, and I often find that language manifests as a material, as a haptic, haptic experience, really, and as something that has been uh, kind of invisibly grafted onto the Black body and its history. Um, and it also manifests within the Black body, right? It comes out in that voice. And thus the song and elocution embedded within this program uh, it was a way to mirror Douglas's history in that way. Um, someone who famously alluded to Shakespearean lyric to perform this call to protect and defend the constitution and the amendments, right? Uh, there are many manifestations of- Go to his house today, inside the hill, you know, there's a space that he used to go off to, you know, when he got, and, you know, he, you know, if you go into that space, you'll find the complete, um, works of Shakespeare on one, you know, it's in the film, if one observes closely. <laughs> and mm -hmm. on the other side is La Mijab, you know. I mean, so you have these two kind of texts, you know, um, you know, central texts, um, if you like, of the English language, which of course he mastered. And interestingly enough, um, you know, Ray Theron, who is a Royal Shakespeare Company actor, you know, he recognized the Shakespearean references in Douglas's work straight away, you know. Um, and I think it's incredible, you know, in a sense, um, the way in which he was able to, you know, grasp language and that kind of written equality in the work. And of course, you know, it was through really then finding out about the relationship to song and how one could translate that kind of sonic um, quality. Um, Paul Gladstone Reed, who worked as a composer, um, you know, did a residency with me um, where we looked at a lot of the early 19th century kind of composers who were working, black composers at that time. Um, and, you know, there are many motifs which we try to embody in that work, um, but it was the work that you, the word that you knew is the sensorial aspect, um, you know, which you um, pointed out to me in relationship to um, the installation, you know, because of course, 
you know, again, one could say, well, why 10 screens? And I think it is this kind of sensorial, you know, immersive, you know, that you want um, the subjects um, viewing, um, you know, to have this kind of bodily, you know, haptic relationship to experiencing the work, you know, um, and in that sense, you know, all the normative aspects, you know, in a kind of linear sense of a single screen, um, you know, you know, they just wouldn't do the kind of work, so to speak, that one needs to do in relationship to the translation of some of these ideas, um, you know, which I think belongs or developed from, you know, these very captive scenarios um, in terms of the legacy that, you know, Black um, subjects um, have inherited, so to speak, and ways in which we can make those become rearticulations, rearticulations of, if you like, um, moving the bar in relationship to where it needs to be today, you know. So I'm very struck by um, the younger generation, your generation, you know, which I think, you know, is really kind of leading us, leading the way to the things um, that we need to do. I mean, I think the other thing I want to say about Douglas as well is that, you know, I mean, it was very controversial that his second wife was white, you know, that in fact that F Frederick Douglass was actually mixed race. Um, and that, you know, this question of sort of interracial, um, if you like, anti-racism, um, which also he was involved in, in terms of his relationship to the suffragette movement. Of course, he had his cause with Susan B. Anthony. Um, you know, when it came to the vote, um, for, um, you know, black men, you know, he took that position, you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, Susan B. Anthony was there when Douglas was literally dying, you know. So I think there's a way in which, you know, this relationship to different movements, to um, the question of um, women's rights and equality. Um, and also, I think in an interesting manner, the way in which this question of, um, you know, to his second wife, um, Helen, who, you know, was a, you know, anti-racist and also someone who campaigned, um, you know, ferociously with Douglas, in fact, um, and her work, you know, in a sense is part of the legacy of why we can go to Douglas's house today. Um, I think that all of these points to the incredible cosmopolitan aspect of Douglas. And, and then at the same time, you know, all the various tensions, you know, um, because I remember in our previous conversation, one of the things that you was talking about was a question about identity and body and the voice. Um, and indeed the question around the performance of blackness, the performance of whiteness, um, of course, to a certain extent, there's an irony in having Douglas, you know, who mastered, you know, the master's language, so to speak, in um, his use of language. Um, and then at the same time claimed it for his own. Um, so I think about that in relationship to, if you like, the question of, you know, multiracial alliances, which I think are incredibly important at this time. And I think one of the things which has really struck me while I've been living here in the States since January for the whole year in this kind of incredibly demanding year um, and very struck, you know, in that moment um, of Black Lives Matter of the kind of white response, you know, from a younger generation that came, which was a tipping point, you know, and so I think there's something, I think, very prophetic and visionary about the work that Douglas was doing, not only just here in America, but the work in England in that abolitionist history where there was this question of transnationalism, but also this question of interracial struggle, you know, against abolitionism, um, for abolitionism and, um, and to, you know, change um, a scenario. And I guess one of the things I often think about in making the work is thinking about Douglas's time and I'm thinking about the time that we inhabit now, whether or not, 
you know, what's a more difficult time? Layla. <laughs> um, I see that we are being flagged for Q and A. Um, I don't know if you all want to switch over to Q and A now, or if we want to just keep going, because you know something we figured out quickly is that Isaac and I can really keep going <laughs> when we're on in a conversational indeed. flow. Um, but we're, we're happy to open it up for questions. Um, thank, thank you so much. I will introduce, this was a wonderful conversation and I'm so glad we have it recorded so we can go over it again and again and again. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Shannon Jackson for organizing this whole event and I want to introduce uh, Hala Kadura and uh, Edgar Fabian Frias for, um, who are our GSIs and who will handle the Q&A uh, coming in from the audiences. We have a whole bunch of questions in the Q&A already. And uh, thank you so much, Leila and Isaac, for this fabulous con and inspiring conversation. And uh, Edgar, are you ready? Let's take it from there. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been definitely incredibly inspiring. We have so many questions. Um, I wanted to see if a person who's here in the audience, Cheryl, asked a wonderful question, if they are available to unmute themselves and ask the question that they asked in the Q&A. Cheryl Derek Coates. Um, can you spell that name? Yeah, C H E R Y L D E R R. Yes, Cheryl, you're allowed to talk. Thank you. Hi, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Um, question for Isaac I was interested in knowing how your art practice developed into like the multi-channel installation video that you are very well known for. I actually had the pleasure of seeing a marvelous entanglement at Art Basel and it was such an immersive sensory experience. And I'm sure that what I'll see at McAvoy next week, cause I have my tickets will be the same, but can you talk about how this sort of became a signature practice and experience for you? Well, I think, you know, that, you know, we had a particular moment and thank you so much for your um, kind comments. Um, um, but just to say that really, I think I've just been involved in a kind of um, movement, which a lot of um, artists have been involved in. It's really the movement from film into the digital, you know, and what digital technology enabled one to um, do. And I think with the relationship between cinema and the gallery, it's also to think about the kind of, if you like, sculptural possibilities. So I would say that language of multiple screens are really part of an experimental film history, but in a way they got translated into a gallery context once you had the advent of new technologies and video projection. And I think also different theories around spectatorship, you know, that you can um, and, and as I said, I think that we're always on we're, we're, we're lots of different screens where, you know, we'll have our, this screen open up now, behind it is another screen, you know, on my computer right now, and another one, a few others. <laughs> and so I just think this sort of seeps into the artistic practice, this way of screens um, interpolating each other and the kind of possibilities to create um, environments film installation environments. And so, um, and then that just developed really, you know, that one went into a area of research and experimentation and then, you know, but of course you have lots of other um, artists who are involved also in the same endeavor. And it's, this is something that I teach now at Santa Cruz University or try to teach. <laughs> Um, and, and in fact, with this um, presentation, I'm working um, through my lab at Santa Cruz on a whole course, uh, online course, in fact, which is a practicum where we're filming um, the exhibition and the processes and just in a way trying to make that be accessible um, for um, students or artists that may want to pursue this way of working as well and to make that more generally kind of, um, you know, um, a part of um, our education right now. Yeah, and if I can uh, sort of just extend that answer, because it really um, 
you know, it, it speaks to a lot of what I also do in my practice, Isaac, which, uh, you know, I've, I've always been inspired by the work that you do in, in the ways that you see video spatially. Um, but in my own practice, I, I, al I also have multi-channel video and structural installation. And I'm really driven by what happens in that immersive experience when your body is uh, engaging with a narrative uh, and is really in tune with all of the different sensations that are occurring in the body and how that can allow you to inhabit the space of a character or a narrative uh, in a way that you wouldn't be able to if you know you were just watching a 2D version or you know projected onto a wall and there is this hyper surveillance that occurs in in spatial you know video installations where there are bodies watching bodies watching bodies. And that, that concept always drives me because there's a moment when you're standing in an installation and you have multiple options for which you can you know, view a story or a narrative and you have to choose. And it's that imposition of choice you know, that um, you know, you're stuck in. And then people are there sort of observing your decision-making process and how you're watching and observing other bodies. And it's that, that, you know, situating yourself in that discomfort in order to process trauma or, you know, whatever is, is going on in your life at the moment, whether it's, you know, race related, gender related, uh, that that's really the core of it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question from Hala. Thank you so much. Uh... Leila and Isaac, that was incredible. Thank you for inspiring us. Uh, I'm gonna go with a question from the audience. It's one of our students, Brandon. Uh, are you still here with us? Brandon Pangalian? Yes. Uh, Brandon, you're on, your mic's open. I think he's still muted. I'm asking to unmute. I can't hear him. Do you want to read his question? Yes. Um, what are the biggest challenges facing an artist coming out of college? And how would you recommend someone approach a career in art? And this question is for both Isaac and Leila. Well, Isaac, you're the recent grad, so. <laughs> No. Uh, would you like to take it away? You're the recent grad, Leela. I, <laughs> I think you're the example, you know, what you're doing now, you know, the, how, did you, how did you get from A to B and C? <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a constant, you know, it's, I'm constantly figuring it out, but I think figuring, like understanding your voice and what drives you um, is really important. Uh, knowing if you want to make a multiplicity under modes of capitalism, if you want to like produce objects for sale, or if you want to create something more experiential, I think it's really about choosing how you, how to situate your practice. And, you know, I think coming out of college, you're, you're tasked with figuring out how to fund your practice, which is something that has been, you know, a, a really big learning curve for me. Um, and I think something that really helped and is helping me still is the ecosystem that I create around my practice and the community that I've built and, and am constantly building in order to help me fund these like really big innovative ideas, which, you know, film is actually is one of the more expensive practices to have, you know, considering equipment. And then when you add the the installation aspects, their, their projectors, their screens. Um, and I think, you know, understanding how to fund and who to ask and uh, how to articulate your practice is where you should start finding, yeah, finding confidence in that voice. Easier said than done, I guess. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a question that a lot of our students have been asking, how do you start? Um, and I believe it's also through starting through making and just experimenting and failing and trying again. So thank you so much. And I think we're going to move back to Edgar. Yes, Edgar. 
Yeah, um, I think we have a question from Erica Demon, who's one of our graduate MFA uh, students. Yes, I see her hands raised. Uh, Erica Demon, I'm opening the mic for you. Hi there. Um, hi, Leila. Hi, Isaac. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, it's so interesting that my hand was raised and I didn't realize it was raised. So uh, it's caught me a little bit off guard. Um, I guess my question is um, just thinking about how you um, build projects. Is there any kind of, is there any kind of seed that you begin with? Um, kind of, I'm just kind of thinking about kind of moving through my own practice into grad school and kind of all of the research that um, I'm kind of undertaking now. Do you do you kind of have any kind of particular starting point that you would that you always kind of come back to? I'm thinking about like a familiar text or or anything that you kind of really um, think about at, at the core of your practice. Well, maybe I mean I could. Um, you know, um, contribute the fact that in relationship to, um, you know, one of my early works, but in a way, something that I've tried to keep as a model, um, I made a work called Looking for Langston in 1989, um, just obsessive about, um, Langston Hughes and how Renaissance, but it's the querying of that sort of movement. And one of the things which I undertook when I was making that work was that you know, um, Leila and I were talking about the relationship to song, for example, music. And um, I could say that I started to research on the soundtrack of that work two years before I shot a single image. And, you know, this concentration on sound and what would be the kind of, if you like, sonic landscape or what would be, um, you know, for example, I um, worked with um an amazing singer and writer blackberry who lives in oakland um who i came across in a conference um a very very long time ago <laughs> who um wrote a song which i felt would be incredible to be in the film and um met up with him came to the bay area um brought him to london he recorded the song and also i commissioned him to make another song um, which was the title um, soundtrack for that work. And all of those materials existed two years before I shot a single image, you know, and the script got constructed on the basis of those songs and thinking about the writing and making of the work. So, I mean, I do think it's a kind of research methodologies. These are things which, um, you, know, you know, when one's teaching that I'm trying to say it'd be a possible point um, or strategy for making work. So, and I think you underestimate the kind of role that research will play in relationship to making work. So, um, even if what you want to do is just improvise when you're making that work, that I think um, those processes are, are really important um, ways of thinking about how one might make you know, films, for example, which are quite in a sense, unconventional to the ways that one might be taught ordinarily in a more conventional, um, you know, context. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yes, no, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Hala. Do you have time for another question? Let's try one. We're at one o'clock, so officially we're done. But uh, would you like? And there's so many more questions of fourteen at least. So would you like to take one more question, Leila and Isaac? No. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Okay, bring it on. Okay. This is a question from our student uh, Dana Fang, and it's specifically for Leila. Could you describe your process of putting together new labor movements and how you chose the different films to feature? Oh, I mean, I'm pretty consistently watching and and looking for filmmakers out in the world because I am I am a part of a collective called the Black Aesthetic, uh, and I 
started sort of started my curatorial practice in that collective and you know we now don't we are currently not curating so uh just like coming off of the heels of that collective process and um always consuming new works by filmmakers um i was asked to consider new um lessons of the hour and in considering that I, you know, sort of pulled out some of the main themes and I thought that the driving question of lessons of the hour was, you know, what is America today, you know, what, 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 what is America today through the eyes of Frederick Douglass, like how would he interpret this moment in time. And so I wanted to select work that embodied that, you know, some, the same complexity and uh, um, you know, a lot of the things that we were talking about here today, considerations of time and uh, all the different kinds of movement. Um, and I think a lot of the filmmakers, it's 17 in total. So really it's a um, very large, you know, group of work, selection of works. Right now you only have the first half, uh, but they really do touch on a lot of those moments uh, in lessons of the hour that have been extracted and sort of distilled in each of the films separately and simultaneously. I don't know if that answered the question, but it, it was a, a long and um, you know constant process of, of consuming and being inspired by, by film works. It did, thank you so much, thank you so much. All right, I see one more hand raised by Jacqueline Francis. Um, are you still with us, Jacqueline Francis? I am. I am. I'd like to ask the final question. <laughs> wow, what an honor to ask these great artists a final question after their incredible presentation. Um, it's it's it, it might be too big a question, but I'll ask it anyway. And the question is about um, transatlantic dialogue. And because both of you, um, you know, had your beginnings, you know, in uh, the coast of the Atlantic in the UK and in um, in the United States. And it seems to me, even as both of you are here now on the Pacific Rim, that there's something that's really dominant about transatlantic studies, transatlantic location, transatlantic cultures that's in your work and in your research. Am I, am I off base with that? Or is that something that I'm on to? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that, yeah, I mean, I think that has been, of course, you know, the question of location, um, where one speaks from, um, becomes you know, very, very significant. But, but I think, you know, in my own work, I've tried to deliberately also offset that. I mean, I've made a work which was shot um, in China called 10,000 Waves. Um, so I think I've tried to put a few steps into that to make that, you know, um, a little bit more complex but I think even if I think about that I mean for me I'm still very struck you know or I would say that that work you know is indeed very much connected to the black I had my hand raised oh, <laughs> I don't know what that was <laughs> a bit of esplanade <laughs> anyway, Lina, you. What do, you... Layla, do you do you have a take on that? Um, I mean, you know, I think I, I mentioned some of it earlier, but uh, my personal history influences my interest in in you know transatlantic uh, narratives and, and transnational blackness. Um, I mean, it, it is a rather large question, a large question, but I don't I don't consider um you know having a father who's african and a mother who's american as mutually exclusive experiences but rather something that is reve that has revealed to me the complexities of belonging in and to a black experience um and you know i make work that incorporates the, the, the those complexities and those complexities influence the cinematic narrative uh so my visual practice places importance on the poetic framing of the the socio-political existence and the bodied and disembodied aesthetics of black being, which you know inherently involves the, the transatlantic uh, stories. Um, yeah. 
that's sort of my short shortened answer. <laughs> wow, thank I, you so I, much. We are we are filled with inspiration and courage, and uh, thank you so much for advocating for the human experience in this most difficult of times, and specifically in the black human experience, um, but really everybody's human condition. So. Um, Thank you so much for this wonderful hour, and uh, I hope we all have a chance to go see the show at McAvoy Foundation for the Arts in Person. It is a truly compelling experience. It'll be up for six months, so there's lots of time to see it. Um, I wanted to thank again Hala Kadura, Edgar Fabian Frias, and uh, of course Paris Coates and uh, Shannon Jackson for making this wonderful a moment happen on our end, and Amy Owen and Nate Gelman and Alex Bodo and Susan. Uh, Miller for making the event happen on McAvoy Foundation for the Arts um, end and uh, this was a truly uh, humbling and moving experience so thank you so much for your time and your efforts and uh, we have a lot of video we could show we didn't get to um, uh, so I apologize for that but um, uh, we, we definitely had the benefit of your conversation. Um, Le Leila Dysak, I'd like to give you the last word to round it out for tonight, for today. I mean, I think the, the words are to really, if you are here in the Bay Area, please go and uh, experience this in person because video is a deeply embodied, you know, watch experience. You have to be there in person to watch it. And I know something that I'm personally missing is sitting in a theater with people. So this isn't quite the theater experience, but you know, it doesn't, it does require your presence. Uh, and I would say give yourselves to to a good two hours to watch to, to watch everything in full thank you and isaac i i just like to simply thank um Lina for participating in this conversation it's been an honor to meet you and uh, we're very excited that um we've been able to work together on this project i'd like to thank you greg for um by this opportunity for us to discuss um, the project and Shannon and of course McAvoy um, for a very decorative. Thank you so much for everything you did um, and hope everybody gets to see the piece. Yeah, thank you so much, Isaac and McAvoy and Berkeley. This was a wonderful experience and I'm really, really grateful to have been in conversation with you, Isaac. All right, thank you all for coming to this special, special event and uh, have a great afternoon and uh, come again next week. We are going to continue uh, with the lecture series. Thank you so much. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>